So before I get to the big news of the day, I want to give you the update on the number one song in America, Facts. So we still have one day to put this thing at the top of the Billboard charts. Billboard itself is now basically acknowledging that Facts, which is my rap song with Tom McDonald's, or more accurately, Tom McDonald's rap, star, rap song featuring me. Billboard is now acknowledging that it's likely to make number one on the Billboard charts, which is hysterically funny, and they are freaking out about it. They put out a piece yesterday over at Billboard.com titled Next Week's Hot 100, Megan The Stallion versus Nicki Minaj versus Ben Shapiro, and they are freaking out. Now, let's be clear. The Hot 100 is not actually the list that we are seeking to be number one on. The one that we want to be number one on is the digital song sales, which is why you should head on over to iTunes. Those are the only sales that are currently being counted in terms of the Billboard digital song sales list. So head on over to iTunes right now if you haven't already bought the song and go do that over there. But Billboard is freaking out about this. And they're freaking out about this for a very simple reason, which is they've attempted to basically bar people like Tom McDonald from the charts. The the hip hop industry is very much infused with left wing thinking on everything from social politics to drug politics to, to all the rest of it. I mean, we all know what hip hop has brought to the world in terms of sort of its moral compass. And that is to say, in large part, not much. And so a song like Facts, which is very much directed the other way, right? As Tom McDonald raps in the song, we're not going to turn your sons into thugs, your daughters into hoes. That's something that the industry simply cannot take. They do not like it at all. And so Billboard is freaking out about this. Billboard put out this piece yesterday saying, yes, really. After right-wing pundit Ben Shapiro helped propel multiple songs to number one this decade, including Megan The Stallion's own WAP back in 2020. With either his endorsement or his disavowal, he's now in pursuit of a Hot 100 topper of his own. He even admits as much on facts, his collab with anti-woke rapper Tom McDonald, as he directs audiences during his own rap verse. Again, yes, really. All my people download this. Let's get a billboard number one. As they point out, we've had no radio support. We are not a big corporation that is dedicated to music and, and manipulating the charts. If you actually go look at the charts over at iTunes, what you will see is that Megan Thee Stallion's Hiss, which is the top competitor for that number one slot right now, alongside Nicki Minaj's Bigfoot, both of those tracks, have now been separated into about eight different versions of the track so as to aggregate sales. So you have a bunch of versions of the same song over and over and over being pumped by these massive corporations in an attempt to prevent Tom's song with me from hitting number one on the Billboard chart. So go make it happen right now, folks. Let's get that Billboard number one. This is sort of your last opportunity today to get in under the wire. So head on over to iTunes and get the song. It is also, again, amazing how the media are deliberately and militantly attempting to not get the joke. They cannot allow the joke to happen. The joke is the funniest joke in the history of pop culture. I'm sorry, it is. Me at the top of the rap charts is indeed the funniest joke in the history of pop culture in the United States. I don't think there's a a big competitor, to be frank with you. And they really don't want to get the joke. So the Washington Post has an entire piece today titled Ben Shapiro's new song hit number one on iTunes. How did that happen? And here is what they write humorlessly. Absolutely humorlessly, because democracy dies in darkness and the Washington Post is, in fact, the darkness. Quote, Ben Shapiro, a right wing political commentator known for his incendiary takes, just made his rap debut with a spitfire song called Facts. It soared to the number one spot on the iTunes store, sitting above recent pop and hip hop hits from the likes of Megan Thee Stallion, Justin Timberlake and Jack Harlow. The song, a collaboration between Shapiro and Canadian rap artist Tom McDonald. To be fair, Tom is the chief artist. You know, I'm going to keep mentioning this because Tom is the one who's actually good at this. Okay, and Tom is being overlooked by some of the media because of the hysterically funny headline that I'm a rap artist now. Tom actually is. In any case, the song is packed with lyrics that take aim at critics, the culture wars, the rap genre in general, and call out rap artists Nicki Minaj and Lizzo. By the way, sidetrack right here. Hat tip to Nicki Minaj, who is who's really, I think, enjoying this whole controversy. Nicki Minaj actually tweeted out this morning, quote, wait till they wake up and listen to what Ben Shapiro is saying in facts. The outrage on this one will be a tad bit delayed. They, like, I'm enjoying it. Nikki, appreciate it. In any case, here's the Washington Post not understanding things. Quote, being number one appears to be a big deal for Shapiro, who founded the Daily Wire in 2015 and currently hosts his own political podcast and radio show. He recently changed his bio on X, formerly Twitter, to read world's number one rapper. He titled one of his recent YouTube podcast videos, I am America's number one rapper, in which he played the entire Fax music video while praising the success of his thought. Wait, you wait, it's a big deal to me, number one? As opposed to, you know, all the other people in the music industry who are attempting to be number three. I love the Washington. It appears to be a big deal to be number. Yes, that's why you're writing about it. I noticed. That's why you're paying attention to it. Like, oh, well, you know, he he seems to care about being number one. Oh, my God. You you, you losers. Truly, you losers who refuse to get the joke. 
They say the song's success mirrors that of other songs that have ties to America's politics, like Jason Aldean's Try That in a Small Town and Oliver Anthony's Rich Men North of Richmond from last summer. And then this thing goes on for like hundreds of words talking in very serious terms about what happened here. Quote, Shapiro has a noted history of criticizing rap music and explicit lyrics. In 2019, he said on his, his show, the rap wasn't a real genre of music igniting a backlash on social media. Well, I mean, I said that because I'm a classically trained musician. And let me just explain what that means for folks who don't actually understand the difference between, say, rap and hip hop and classical music. To be a classically trained musician means you will spend in your life tens of thousands of hours practicing at an instrument so that you can play some of the greatest music ever written. To be a number one charting billboard rap artist means being featured in a Tom McDonald song where I rapped for like 30 seconds and my lifelong preparation for that was talking. That is not the same thing remotely in kind. But again, the media are militantly refusing to, to get the joke. And so that makes the joke even funnier, of course. And we can only hope that at the Grammys, we'll receive some sort of recognition for the fact that we are, in fact, the number one song in America. And we need your help today to make sure, just to, again, Billboard is basically acknowledging we will be number one on the digital download chart, which is the one that we're aiming for. We need your help with that. So head on over to iTunes right now and give us that final push today. We'll get to more on this in just one second. First, if there is one must-have app on my phone, it's ExpressVPN. I know adding an extra step to anything you do every day just sounds like a hassle, but... If you knew how easy it was to protect your connection with ExpressVPN, you'd already be doing it. ExpressVPN is the easiest way to browse the internet safely and securely without all the hassle you hate about the other VPNs. Other VPNs slow your connection to the point where it's not even worth it to connect, but ExpressVPN doesn't lag or buffer. You can stream in HD with no issues. All you need to do is open the app, click one button, enjoy instant protection all across your devices. Once you connect, you don't even... Realize you have it on, but your connection is secure. Your data is 100% encrypted. It's no wonder ExpressVPN has been called the best VPN by Business Insider and Tech Radar. Right now, go to expressvpn.com slash Ben. You can get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash Ben. Get three extra months of ExpressVPN for free. When you sign up, expressvpn.com slash Ben. It's the way I protect my data. You should do the same. Head on over to expressvpn.com slash Ben to get started. Okay, meanwhile, in actual news, in actual news, there's a video that has now gone viral and it is indicative of the chief issue in the 2024 campaign. And it's going to remain the chief issue in the 2024 campaign until some other issue takes precedence. And there's a long time between now and the election. But right now, the big issue of this campaign and the big issue of our time is human migration. Human migration is the big issue of our time. It's causing a vast turmoil in European politics. It's causing vast turmoil in Africa. It's causing vast turmoil in the United States because it turns out that large swaths of human beings crossing borders willy-nilly causes conflict. And so what we are seeing in the United States are the results of that conflict. Here's a video. This came out day before yesterday. It is a, it is a migrant mob, an illegal immigrant mob, pounding a pair of cops near Times Square over the weekend. Here's what that video looks like. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. So you can see these these guys are just jumping these two cops, like a bunch of them. They're just jumping these two cops. They're beating them down on the streets. This has to be, what, 10, 12 illegal immigrants? Apparently, police initially busted four of the asylum-seeking thugs. Now, remember, they're seeking asylum. What have I been saying for weeks? I made this documentary about the Southern border. You should go check it out at dailywire.com because it's a fantastic documentary talking about exactly what is happening. To understand what is happening, you have to understand the chief signal thing the Biden administration did is they said, you now have a magic word to get into the United States of America. You walk up to the border, you find a border patrol agent, you shout, I fear to go back to my home country. This amounts to a legal asylum claim. At that point, you are not held in Mexico pending a hearing on whether you, in fact, have the right to seek asylum. You are not actually held in detention. They process you and they release you to the interior where you go to New York and you beat the living shit out of cops. That apparently is, is the, the way that immigration is working in the United States. Now, of course, the vast majority of people who are crossing the border are not doing this. But why should any of this be happening? Literally, this should not be happening. These, these people were seeking asylum. And what they really are are criminals who are seeking to participate in criminality. According to the New York Post, the footage shows an NYPD officer and lieutenant initially telling the migrants to move along around 8.30 p.m. Saturday on West 42nd Street in Manhattan, which, of course, is like the heart of Manhattan. 
That is before things quickly got rowdy as a scuffle broke out between the cops and a suspect who was wrestled to the ground. And then the rest of the illegal immigrants converged on the officers and started beating the hell out of them. The video shows the two officers left on the ground as the pack runs east on 42nd Street towards 7th Avenue and gets away, but not for long. Police initially busted four of the asylum-seeking thugs, identified as Darwin Andres Gomez Iscael, 19, Kelvin Servatarocha, 19, Juarez Wilson, 21, and Norman Riveran, 24, adding to the rich diversity of the United States. All four were charged with assault and released without bail, according to sources. Perfect New York story. Illegal immigrants on the streets beating the hell out of cops, released without bail. A fifth suspect, Yohan Boada, 22, was arrested Monday night and charged with attempted assault of a police officer. The Manhattan DA's office say they are still investigating the incident and reviewing additional video of the alleged assault. One of the men has two open cases in Manhattan for assault and robbery. So he's been arrested twice before, is an illegal immigrant, has not been deported, got arrested again for assaulting a cop, and then got released from jail immediately without bail. In November, he allegedly... Pu- pushed, punched, and bit a Nordstrom Rack employee who caught him lifting a $130 item from the Union Square store's display rack, according to law enforcement sources. Also last month, Reverend also punched with a closed fist a loss prevention officer at the Herald Square Macy's after trying to pull off a robbery with two other suspects. So this guy's just a career criminal in the United States pretending he has an asylum claim. This is Joe Biden's America. This is Joe Biden's immigration policy. This is Joe Biden's choice to let people like this into the country. He has the law on the books that would allow him to stop all of this. This wouldn't have happened. This is this under Donald Trump's immigration policy. People like this would be turned back at the border. They would have been remaining in Mexico, awaiting their asylum hearing. The shocking incident is just the latest example of asylum seekers running afoul of the law in the Big Apple, according to the New York Post. Again, this is you should not be shocked by things that are perfectly predictable. In fact, As Yohan Boada, who's the last one who just got arrested, was leaving Manhattan criminal court without bail, he flipped off the press. Literally walks out, flashes two middle fingers at the press as he walks out. NYPD Chief of Patrol John Chell told reporters, you saw the video, reprehensible, they're cowards. You have eight people attacking a lieutenant and a cop, running up to them to kick them in the face. Meanwhile, this dude is just walking out free, flipping off the press. Why are people like this in our country? Why? There is no right to be in our country if you are a criminal. There is no right to be in our country if you are a citizen of another country and you are not legally claiming asylum, if your asylum claim is bullcrap. And yet the the wild left has captured the Democratic Party to the extent that they are refusing to say the obvious, which is these people should not be in our country. They should not be in our country. We'll get to more on this in just one second. First, it's a struggle to find tasty, healthy food at the grocery store these days. Everything seems to have more labels than calories. Fortunately for you, My friends at Good Ranchers are extending their new year, new meat offer, but only for my listeners. You're not going to find this deal anywhere else. Here's what you have to do. Go to GoodRanchers.com, subscribe to any of their boxes, use code Shapiro at checkout. They'll add over two pounds of chicken breast, that's $189 value, to every order you receive for the next year. That's over 25 pounds of pre-trimmed, better than organic chicken for free. I actually have had a kosher steak from Good Ranchers, like the one kosher steak they made. It was amazing. And everything from Good Ranchers is that good. My people tell me so. They sent me salmon from their wild-caught seafood box. That was also amazing, by the way. Good Ranchers only sources from the best meat America has to offer, completely antibiotic, hormone, and vaccine-free. If you're not sure which box to choose, you can try their brand-new Weekly Essentials box filled with pre-trimmed beef and chicken, saving you time on meal preparation without sacrificing flavor. Stock your fridge with Good Ranchers today. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use my code Shapiro to enjoy free chicken for a year. That's GoodRanchers.com. Code Shapiro. Claim your free chicken. GoodRanchers.com. American meat delivered. How far left is the left move? So Anna Kasparian, who we've had on the show right over at the Young Turks, she made the signal error the other day of actually saying on the air that people like this should be deported. And people went nuts on her. How could she do this? Here's a clip of Anna. These are not people you need to provide cover for. These are people who are in the country claiming asylum, they don't have a right to be here. It is a privilege to be able to take advantage of our asylum program. For this, she's been receiving extraordinary blowback because the somewhat rational left is being completely expelled by the actual radical left. That is the current state of things. And you can see that this battle inside the Democratic Party, now I know everybody is sort of giving up the ghost for the moderate Democrats, I think it's a little early for that. This is a battle that still has to be fought inside the Democratic Party because the impact of illegal immigration in blue centers is finally starting 
to be felt. Here, for example, is the Massachusetts governor, Maura Healey, crying as she announces she's converting a recreation center into a housing facility for illegal immigrants. Emotional, guys, OK, because I'm committed to this. Little kids need to be able to breathe clean air. They need to be able to access swimming pools. They need to have lifeguards there who are going to teach them how to swim. And they need to have activities. I don't know what we're going to do for a couple, three months. I'll call universities. I'll call other places. Okay, now here's the problem. This is going to be used as an emergency shelter for people who are sleeping literally at Logan Airport. They're literally sleeping, in illegal immigrants, at Logan International Airport. The Cass Recreation Center is the center that is going to be used as sort of the overflow center that is going to accommodate 400 people or about 100 families. But local members of the community are like, what the hell? Like, seriously, what the hell? Why do we have a, a, an extraordinary number of illegal immigrants who have now taken over the rec center that we pay our taxes for so that we can use? What, 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 why is this happening? And meanwhile, you have this radical governor of Massachusetts crying over it. Well, good luck. Good luck. If you think that's a winning message, good luck to you. Meanwhile, here is Democratic Denver Mayor Mike Johnson pointing out that the city of Denver is completely filled up, that every hotel in the city of Denver has been taken over by illegal immigrants. So we've always had a length of stay policy here, which was generally individual adults could stay for 14 days and families could stay for 37 days. We paused it for about four to six weeks during very, very cold times in November and December. Every hotel room we have in the city of Denver is full. We're at 5,000 people in shelter and we have more coming every day. I think our city is very close to its breaking point now. Yeah, it's, it's, that's right. That's right. And, and many Democrats are starting to see it. I mean, people ranging from John Fetterman to the Democratic mayor of Denver. They, they do see it in these other cities, by the way. Eric Adams sees it in New York. Brandon Johnson sees it in Chicago. I mean, they're all seeing it. They're just pretending they don't see it. And you can only pretend that reality doesn't exist for so long before even your typical voters start to turn on you. And that is what is happening with regard to immigration and Joe Biden, which, again, he is losing that issue by leaps and bounds. His only response to this is going to be abortion, by the way. He's not going to even deal with the immigration issue. The immigration issue is just going to simmer the entire year. He's instead going to redirect an abortion and try to get suburban women to vote against Donald Trump based on their supposed need for an abortion, despite the fact that suburban women aren't actually having that many abortions in the United States at this point in time. But the immigration issue for a huge number of Americans is going to continue to grow in size as well it should. By the way, all it would take is, God forbid, one serious terrorist attack by an illegal immigrant crossing America's southern border, which there are countries that are attempting to funnel terrorists across America's southern border, given that it is wide open at this point. All it would take is a serious attack to completely shift the nature of American politics, perhaps for a generation. Because it turns out that we've, America, that the great promise of America is free markets and security, just in terms of what the government is supposed to provide you. Property rights and security. Those are the things that America historically has done incredibly well. Well, if it feels like both of those things are in danger, that's something that Americans are not going to react well to. According to the new Bloomberg Swing States poll, the question was, how responsible, if at all, is President Biden for the increase in migrants crossing the U.S.-Mexico border? 61% say responsible. Only 29% say not responsible. That, by the way, includes 38% of Democrats who say that Joe Biden is responsible for the huge increase in illegal immigration at the border. That includes 59% of Hispanics, 47% of Blacks, as opposed to 36% who say that he is not responsible for all of that. 52% of Americans trust Donald Trump on immigration compared to 30% of Americans trusting Joe Biden. By the way, on the economy, the numbers are fairly similar. On the economy, Trump is trusted by 51% this is in the swing states versus 33% for Joe Biden. So right now you're seeing some national polling data that's suggesting that Biden has opened up a lead in, in a head to head. Quinnipiac University put out a poll yesterday. They put out this poll and they show a lead of Biden, a significant lead, a 50 to 44 percent lead among registered voters in a hypothetical general election matchup. Now, there is a difference between registered voters and likely voters. Likely voter polls tend to be better. Registered voter polls tend to be worse. The reason is because, again, there are a lot of registered voters who are simply not going to vote in the upcoming election. This is the big problem for Joe Biden. He won when you have the biggest spike in election votes in American history when the number of votes in a presidential election shifts by extraordinary percentages. In 2016, there are approximately 157 million voters and there are about 136 million votes cast. In 2020, 157, 155 million people showed up to vote in 2020. 155 million people. That is an increase of, again, 
like 18 to 20 million people in one election cycle. That is not going to replicate this time. It's going to, turnout is going to be down in 2024. It will. Mainly because all of the voting rules are going to shift back to normal and a lot of people are going to be expected to, you know, go to a polling place and actually vote. You're not going to get people voting five months in advance of the election by mail. Something like 60% of all Democratic voters in the last election cycle voted by mail. That is not going to replicate this time. So while you're seeing a lot of polls that are starting to emerge nationally in the states, Donald Trump does, in fact, retain a lead. Donald, and that lead is going to be durable so long as Joe Biden continues to destroy the situation on the border. And he is doing that single handedly, by the way. This is one reason the border deals on life support. If Republicans actually thought that there was a, a chance that Joe Biden was going to shut down the border, if Joe Biden actually just today came out and he said, listen, we're doing remain in Mexico and we are also going to make sure that if you have an asylum application, that you have to stay in detention until that is adjudicated. If Joe Biden made those two changes today, the chances of a border deal would go up significantly, not just because Republicans might then believe that they had something like a credible partner in shutting the border and maintaining a border at all, but also because the political incentives would, would switch. Then it would move from, if there is a compromise on the border that bails Joe Biden out to, if there's a compromise on the border that shifts the law in a direction that we like, that is a, a cementing of actions that Joe Biden is already taking. What Republicans are, are afraid of is that they are going to sign on to a border deal and Joe Biden is then going to absolutely screw them in terms of the executive implementation of that deal. And they are right to be particularly frightened of that. When you see all these Republican senators who are out there right now saying things about the bill and the bill's so great and this, that, we have not yet seen the text of the bill. I can't adjudicate whether I think the bill is good or tell you whether I think the bill is good until I've actually seen the bill. We'll get to more on this in just one second. First, Balance of Nature, fruits and veggies, they're the most convenient way to get whole food ingredients every single day. Balance of Nature uses an advanced cold vacuum process that encapsulates fruits and veggies into whole food supplements without sacrificing natural antioxidants. The capsules are completely void of additives, fillers, extracts, synthetics, pesticides, or added sugar. The only thing in Balance of Nature's fruit and veggie capsules are, you know, like fruits and veggies. Right now, not only will my listeners get 35% off your first order, you'll now get a free fiber and spice supplement as well. Balance of Nature's fiber and spice supplement is a revolutionary fiber drink with a unique blend of 12 spices and whole foods. Producer Zach brings it on the road. We're on the road a lot these days. Balance of Nature has been keeping him alive and productive. There's never been an easier way to make sure you're getting your daily dose of fruits and veggies. Experience Balance of Nature for yourself today. Go to balanceofnature.com. Use promo code Shapiro for 35% off your first order as a preferred customer. Plus, get a free bottle of fiber and spice. That's balanceofnature.com. Promo code Shapiro. Get 35% off your first preferred order plus a free bottle of fiber and spice today. So it is very likely, of course, that the bill is going to go nowhere. House Speaker Mike Johnson has used rumors of the bill's contents to pronounce it DOA. Senator James Lankford of Oklahoma said he's been meeting with Republicans one-on-one -on -one to clear up information about the bill. Senator Kirsten Sinema, she says the rumors swirling about what this does and does not do are wrong. So the question is, why not just release what the deal is? Once we know what the deal is, then we can decide whether or not to, to give the deal. Bottom line, though, is that there's only one person who can bail Joe Biden out of the situation, and it is, in fact, Joe Biden. Meanwhile, Joe Biden quickly trying to backfill many of his problems with his own domestic base particularly among blue-collar white voters. That is the, the constituency, believe it or not, that Joe Biden actually cut into against Donald Trump in 2020. Donald Trump overperformed with minorities. Donald Trump overperformed in urban areas. Donald Trump underperformed with blue-collar white workers in 2020. Statistically, he actually underperformed what he'd done in 2016 in 2020. I know it's weird to say that, but that actually is the statistical truth. Well, a lot of those voters are now turning again back to Donald Trump in a way from Joe Biden, which presumably is why Joe Biden is now pretending he cares about East Palestine, Ohio. You'll recall that East Palestine, Ohio was a place where there's a major train derailment. There's a toxic spill. And uh, and Joe Biden just didn't go there for a year. And Pete Buttigieg didn't go there. And Pete Buttigieg was on TV talking about why it was necessary for him to take paternity leave to care for his uh, his husband, who obviously was egregiously physically wounded during the birth of their of their child. Uh, in any case, uh, Karine Jean-Pierre is explaining why Joe Biden is visiting East Palestine. The answer is that Joe Biden is trying to shore up that sort of Rust Belt base that he thinks he has here. East Palestine, why, um, why did the administration decide that um, things have, I guess, coalesced and it's now the time for uh, President Biden to go? 
So uh, the mayor and uh, community leaders invited the president uh, to meet with uh, East Palestine uh, residents and also assess uh, the recovery uh, progress that's been going on uh, for some time now, as you all know. And so the president had always said that he would go when it is most helpful uh, to the community. And with this inv invitation, obviously, uh, very recent, uh, and the current uh, status of the recovery, we felt that the time was right again. We got an invitation from the mayor and community leaders to uh, to come and very very recently and so we are working uh, with them to figure out uh, the best time to do that in February oh is, is that when you received the invitation very recently by very recently do you mean a year ago because that's not usually how we keep time in the real world is very recently is like a year ago if my if, if, if I say that I took my wife out to dinner recently what I mean by that is in 2022 that's not recently that's not how it works again Joe Biden has to shore up that marginal base because he is just campaigning incredibly weak. His poll numbers are really bad. And because they're so bad, he's trying pretty much everything in the book, which is presumably also why Joe Biden is now attempting to buy off Michigan Muslim voters. That is effectively what he is doing right now with all of his idiot talk about the Middle East. I got to say, his Middle Eastern policy has been a complete crap show since he took office, whether it is reorienting away from Saudi Arabia, reorienting away from Israel, orienting toward Iran, being incredibly conciliatory toward the Ayatollahs, declaring the Houthis a non-terror group, trying to undermine the Saudi regime. Well, like Joe Biden has made nothing but missteps in the Middle East, like over and over and over. And now they're looking at maybe doing their biggest misstep of all. And the reason that they're doing that is, of course, because Joe Biden's radical base is pro Hamas. There's a radical part of the Democratic Party, not the whole Democratic Party. There's a radical part of the Democratic Party that actually is kind of warm toward Hamas and would like to see Israel disappear. And that radical base does exist in places ranging from Chicago to Michigan. Last night, the Chicago City Council, there's a 23 to 23 tie at the city council, and it was broken by the moron mayor of Chicago, Brandon Johnson, who has presided over the continuing collapse of one of America's great cities. And um, Chicago voted for a ceasefire in Gaza, which at this point, I should note, there should be they should actually vote for a ceasefire in Chicago. That'd be more appropriate considering that there were 617 murders in Chicago last year alone. And then in 2023, there were 2,452 shootings in Chicago. Maybe they should work on the ceasefire in Chicago before they work on the ceasefire in Gaza. But of course, this is how you please your radical left base. And Brandon Johnson is, in fact, a radical leftist idiot. Before this resolution, a motion, even though there is no tie. Uh, so I will exercise my vote, yes. my right, and my vote aye. Yeah! Guys, we did it. We did it. We 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 got a ceasefire in Gaza. Uh, you got nothing. You got nothing. I'm sorry. There is no ceasefire in Gaza, nor will there be a ceasefire in Gaza. But you have a bunch of pro-Hamas terror supporters who are extremely excited about Chicago voting for a ceasefire in Gaza. Well, good news, folks. I have singularly declared world peace. It's All your problems are solved. I've also declared universal prosperity. I voted for it. I said it. Therefore, it exists. Or alternatively, y'all are a bunch of morons. We'll get to more on this in just one second. First, are you struggling with back taxes or unfiled returns this year? The IRS is escalating collections. They've added 20,000 new agents. Oh, no. In these challenging times, their best defense is to use Tax Network USA. Along with hiring thousands of new agents and field officers, the IRS has kicked off 2024 by sending over 5 million pay-up letters to those who have unfiled tax returns or balances owed. These guys are not your friends. Don't waive your rights and speak with those agents on your own without backup. That'd be a foolish move. Tax Network USA, a trusted tax relief firm, has saved over a billion dollars in back taxes for their clients. They can help you secure the best deal possible. Whether you owe 10 grand or 10 million bucks, they can help. Whether it's business or personal taxes, whether you have the means to pay or you're on a fixed income, Tax Network can finally resolve your tax burdens once and for all. Seize control of your financial future right now. Do not let tax issues overpower you. Contact. Tax Network USA for immediate relief and expert guidance. Call 1-800-245-6000 or visit TNUSA.com slash Shapiro. Again, turn to Tax Network USA. Find your path to financial peace of mind. That's TNUSA.com slash Shapiro. That radical left base does matter to Joe Biden, which is why he keeps massaging the shoulders of people protesting him and shouting about how much they love radical terror groups that murder Jews and rape women and kill babies. In fact, how, how radical are certain parts of the Democratic Party? So last night in the House of Representatives, there was a vote. The vote was a bill to bar from the United States all Hamas members and anyone involved with the Islamist terror group October 7th attack on Israel. That seems like a pretty obvious one, right? Like you don't get to come to the United States if you are a member of the terrorist group Hamas. 
Seems rational, right? Or if you were involved and you know a direct terror assault that killed 1,200 people and took 240 people into hostage situations, into tunnels. If you're involved in that, it seems like you probably shouldn't enter the United States. It's like baseline stuff, right? There were, in fact, there was near unanimity in the House for this, for this very, very easy notion. There were two voters who said no. Who said no. If you're a member of Hamas, you should be allowed to come into the United States. If you are, if you were involved in an actual terror attack on October 7th, you should also be allowed into the United States. Who were these uh, truly evil human beings? Wait for it. You know what's coming. Representative Cori Bush, who when she is not expending allegedly taxpayer dollars to pay off her various relations, is, uh, is voting in favor of Hamas. And Rashida Tlaib, your Democrat from Terror Island over here. It, it is amazing. In a statement, Tlaib said the bill incited hatred against people like her. What, you mean terrorists? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm confused. I don't think Rashida Tlaib is a terrorist. Is she declaring herself in total solidarity with Hamas terrorists? Because she's saying the quiet part out loud, if so. She denounced the bill as another GOP messaging bill being used to incite anti-Arab, anti-Palestinian, anti-Muslim hatred that makes communities like ours unsafe. I should point out at this point that she says it's a GOP messaging bill. It literally passed 412 to like two. Sorry, 422 to two was the actual vote. 422 to two was the actual vote here. So yeah, that's a, that's a GOP messaging bill in which 422 people vote one way and she and Cori Bush vote the other. By the way, again, you're sort of saying the quiet part out loud. If you say we can't discriminate against terrorists because people might think that terrorists are Muslims or that it is inciting anti-Arab, anti-Palestinian, anti-Muslim hatred to discriminate against Hamas, what are you saying exactly? Sort of like the argument that if you if you pass a crime bill, that this is going to incite anti-Black violence. Like, um... I'm not the one saying that crime is black and I'm not saying that terror is Muslim. I'm saying terror is terror and Hamas is Hamas. But Rashida Tlaib, these people do hold sway in this administration. They do, which is why, and the Washington Post and the media are fully in this camp. The Washington Post is truly a despicable publication, truly despicable. They have a piece by a person named Yasmin Abu Taleb in the Washington Post called Michigan's Arabs and Muslims pushed to defeat Biden in critical state. And this entire article is about how terrible Joe Biden is for supporting Israel in its war against Hamas. And Aya, like many Arab American and Muslim voters in Dearborn, where Arab Americans make up a majority of the population, you'll remember them doing like a Palestinian march early on, like before even Israeli retaliation for the terror attack in which there were actual terror flags being flown, is resolved not only to withhold his vote from Biden, but to actively campaign against him. Some Michigan Arabs and Muslims have launched an abandoned Biden campaign part of a broader national movement still getting off the ground to ensure those in their community show up to cast their vote, but not for Biden. So they're not going to vote for Donald Trump, obviously, because Trump is way more pro-Israel than Joe Biden by every available metric. But they are going to yell at Joe Biden, and Joe Biden is very scared of the yelling. And so he has decided, apparently, he and his State Department are trying to decide on a new strategy, a new strategy for the Middle East. This strategy involves full-scale surrender to terror organizations, like full-scale no stops, surrender. We'll get to that momentarily. First, sup, y'all. Don't mean to flex on you. We all know I'm the number one rapper in the world thanks to Facts by Tom McDonald and me, you know, Jupac, the notorious B-E-N, Dr. Dreidel, the leader of the Jutang clan. Now, it's no question that when I dropped on the scene with that Facts hoodie, I ate. No, 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 not like Lizzo, but like my threads were fire. If you want your drip to be busting, my guy, you have to cop this hoodie immediately. No cap, unless you're Jewish. When you wear this hoodie, you'll roast the left and riz the rest. The fact hoodie is on sale right now in the Daily Wire shop. So get out your dollar dollar bills, y'all. Stand up for the little hustlers like us. Stand up against the libs in the music industry. Go to dailywire.com slash shop to buy your fact hoodie today. The most coveted piece of clothing on the planet. Hurry, these hoodies are so goaded with the sauce, they'll be sold out quicker than I spit bars. Okay, meanwhile, so what is Joe Biden's actual Middle Eastern policy now? Now it's preemptive surrender. So the State Department is apparently now, according to Barack Ravid, reporting for Axios, the State Department is now being asked by the Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, to conduct a review and present policy options on possible U.S. and international recognition of a Palestinian state after the war in Gaza, according to two U.S. officials briefed on the issue. That's insane. Let me explain why that is insane. There is no government. The Palestinian Authority does not even govern the West Bank. It has the approval of 0% of the Palestinian population. My polling data is not zero, but it's very close to zero, which is why Mahmoud Abbas, the 88-year-old kleptocrat, 
who has stolen billions of dollars from his own people. Same thing with Ismail Haniya over in Hamas land. He's living at five-star hotels in Qatar while the rest of his people are living in rubble. But the Palestinian Authority, it does not have the approval of its own people. Mahmoud Abbas is currently in the, if my math is correct, 19th year of a four-year term. The last election that was held was, I believe, 2006 in the West Bank. And it was rigged in favor of Mahmoud Abbas so that Hamas would not win. And he's still serving as quote-unquote president. He also happens to be a Holocaust-denying Jew hater who has walked away from the table on multiple occasions when presented with a peace deal most recently by Ehud Olmert, the most generous peace deal ever offered to the Palestinians. He simply walked away from the table, no counter offer. That is one party in the governing structure of the Palestinian of the Palestinian areas. Other governing structures, Islamic Jihad, a full-on terror group, Hamas, a full-on terror group. There is no government. There's no government. Not only that, there is no territorial border. No border has been decided upon. If you take a look at the West Bank, it looks like an Andy Warhol painting. It's all over the place. The reason it's all over the place is because you have intermixed populations because there had never been any sort of status settlement after the 67 war. Now, remember, between 1948 and 1967, the Arabs controlled the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Jordan controlled the West Bank. The Gaza Strip was controlled by Egypt. At no point did Egypt try to create a Palestinian state in the Gaza Strip. And at no point did Jordan try to create a Palestinian state in the West Bank. The Arabs don't care about a Palestinian state in any of these areas. In fact, they know full well that if a Palestinian state were to be created in these areas, it would immediately be a terror state directed at them. The Jordanians are not really in favor of a pa- an independent Palestinian state governed by the Palestinian Authority or Hamas. That is a direct threat to the Hashemite regime in Jordan. The Egyptians don't want a Palestinian state in the Gaza Strip. That's why they have a border wall that makes Israel's border wall look like nothing. At the so-called Rafah Gate, down the border between Egypt and the Gaza Strip. In other words, a Palestinian state, number one, is in no one's interest in the region. Literally no one, a pal- including the Palestinians, because their governing structure would not exist. It would be garbage and it would foment terrorism and lead to full scale war. If a Palestinian state were actually to exist and then they were to attack Israel, Israel would have no humanitarian obligations at all because now you are at war directly with another sovereign state. At that point, all bets are off. Like the worst thing for the Palestinians would be to have a Palestinian state governed by either the PA or Hamas. There is no governing structure. So saying that you are going to preemptively declare a Palestinian state with no borders, no government representative of the people, no power powerful enough to even govern the areas that are supposedly governed, And no rationale for why this state would somehow make the world a better place, more solid, why this place would be governed in allegiance to anything like fundamentally decent principles, as opposed to just becoming a a horrifying Sharia law state, which is what Hamas wants, for example. What the hell is Joe Biden thinking? What the hell is he thinking? I mean, it's crazy. Not only is it stupid and morally benighted, it also happens to be utterly unrealistic. I may as well declare a state of Shapiro stand somewhere in Southeast Asia. I don't have any territorial holdings there. I don't know what the borders are. There's no government that's approved by the people there. But sure, I mean, I, why, why not? I mean, sure, like we'll just declare a state of Shapiro stand. It has all of the same qualities as a quote unquote state of Palestine. No government, no government capable of holding territory, no government capable of governing people and no rationale for existing per se. But sure, like it'll be great. It'll be great. By the way, notice the priorities here from the Biden administration. Are we talking about an independent Kurdistan? I noticed not. Are you talking about an independent Somaliland? I noticed not. On, on the list of, pe- uh, of peoples who deserve a state right now, in the sense that the state will actually not be a threat to Western interests and will not be a full-on fomenting terror state, the Palestinian state idea comes like dead last. It's really low on that priority list. So why exactly is Joe Biden doing all this? And there are two reasons. One, again, is to please his left-wing domestic base. And the other reason is because the, the State Department is filled with morons. And these morons have a peculiar belief that if you simply give terrorists what they want, then they will be nice to you. And that somehow this will foment peace in the region. Leading the way among these morons is Thomas Friedman. Thomas Friedman is truly the stupidest person to write on foreign policy in my lifetime. It is not particularly close. Thomas Friedman's entire bag is, what if I travel around and get wined and dined by random regimes and then write rosy rose-colored glasses views of these awful regimes. He's done it with Iran. He did it with China. I'll go all over the place. I'll be wine and dine by these various regimes. And then I'll talk to taxi drivers. 
And those taxi drivers will, will bestow their wisdom upon me. And then I will go and meet with Joe Biden and help define his foreign policy. So he has a piece today titled, A Biden Doctrine for the Middle East is Forming. And it's big. So what exactly would this Biden doctrine be? He says, on one track would be a strong and resolute stand on Iran, including a robust military retaliation against Iran's proxies and agents in the region in response to the killing of three U.S. soldiers at a base in Jordan by a drone apparently launched by a pro-Iranian militia in Iraq. Okay, so that hasn't materialized at all. There has been no harsh response by the Biden administration to the murder of three American soldiers in Jordan. None. Zero. They're saying they're destroying like drone outlets. Uh -huh. Yeah, we believe you. You have high levels of credibility. I'm sure that you've just, uh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure you're not just hitting a camel in the ass or blowing up an empty building. I'm sure Joe Biden is, is taking harsh measures. On the second track, says Thomas Friedman, would be an unprecedented U.S. diplomatic initiative to promote a Palestinian state now. It would involve some form of U.S. recognition of a demilitarized Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza Strip that would come into being only once Palestinians had developed a set of defined credible institutions and security capabilities to ensure that this state was viable and that it could never threaten Israel. Oh, well, I mean, under those conditions, I'm sure a Palestinian state being pursued right now is definitely going to happen. When unicorns are farting energy. Sure, that, that seems like that's right around the corner. By the way, the, the message that Joe Biden and the State Department are sending right now, let's just look at the timeline here. Joe Biden and the State Department were not pushing the immediate recognition of a Palestinian state because it's idiocy. Then October 7th happens. 1,200 Jews get murdered. And now the Biden administration is like, what if we just give them what they want? So what, what does that say? What is the message? The message is if you kill enough Jews, Joe Biden will give you a state. That is the actual message. The actual message is if you murder enough Jews, Joe Biden will conciliate to your position. How does that strengthen the West exactly? Seriously, how is that good for America? How's it good? Like, because the same logic would apply to Americans, presumably. That if you kill enough Americans, Joe Biden will just give you what you want. This is the, this is the most appeasement-oriented policy I've ever even remotely heard of. Hamas murders 1,200 Jews. The Palestinian Authority has on its books laws that pay people who murder Jews. And the Biden administration is like, what if we uphold the UNRWA, which is the Hamas front group? What if we actually like give the Palestinian Authority a state? What if we do all of those things? That'd be great. According to Thomas Friedman, Biden administration officials have been consulting experts inside and outside the U.S. government about different forms of this recognition of Palestinian statehood might take. Okay, so again, no expert can simply wish cast a Palestinian state that is moderate and not a threat to its neighbors into existence. They tried to wish cast it into existence during the Oslo Accords. That was literally the Oslo Accords. And for 30 years, we've, we've operated in the Middle East under this delusion. And it's a stupid, asinine, foolish, nincompoopish idea. Ridiculous. On the third track, according to Thomas Friedman, would be a vastly expanded U.S. security alliance with Saudi Arabia which would also involve Saudi normalization of relations with Israel. If the Israeli government is prepared to embrace a diplomatic process leading to a demilitarized Palestinian state led by a transformed Palestinian authority. Well, okay, again, when the rainbows fart, when, when the unicorns fart rainbows, I guess that we're there. If the administration can pull this together, a huge if, a Biden doctrine could become the biggest strategic realignment in the region since the 19, 7, 1979 Camp David Treaty. Well, and, and, if I could, and if I could somehow solve the problem of cold fusion, energy would be free. Well, but by the way, what's amazing about Thomas Friedman's idiot plan, which is now being embraced again by the idiot Biden administration, I've used the word idiot here a lot, but truly these people are, are mentally deficient. The, what, what's so funny about this is that, you know who pursued two of these three tracks and was successful? Donald Trump. You know who actually took harsh anti-Iranian action? Donald Trump. He killed Qasem Soleimani, the head of the Al-Quds force. He put the harshest sanctions in American history on Iran. And you know what it did? It contained Iran. He made clear that if Iran crossed lines, they would get clocked in the face. And you know what Iran did? They shut up. Meanwhile, you'll recall the Trump administration made warm overtures toward the Saudis and toward the UAE and toward Bahrain and toward Morocco. And you know what they did? They all made peace with Israel. And Saudi was going to do it too. In other words, the centrality of the Palestinians to anything remotely like peace in the Middle East is not only a lie, it is a pernicious and counterproductive lie. But that's exactly what the Biden administration is now embracing. Why? Because they are so wedded to their own stupid foreign policy, they can't separate themselves from it, number one. And number two, they're getting blackmailed by their own voting base. And they don't have the strength of character to recognize that actually not supporting terror regimes in the establishment of a state might be good policy. Meanwhile, you know, Elon Musk has come under fire because Elon Musk is not of the left. Elon Musk is the most creative entrepreneur of our time by far, which is why he's the richest man in the world. He started a multiplicity of unbelievably interesting companies, ranging from Tesla, which is a great company, to SpaceX, which is, in my opinion, even a greater company. He's, he's 
simply a singular figure in modern Western life. He's, he's an incredible figure, which is why people are coming after him. They were all fine with him. He was, he was the entrepreneur who was interesting and fascinating and quirky and all of this stuff until the point he bought X. As soon as he started making sounds that he liked free speech and wanted to open up the auspices of, of social media to various alternative opinions, the world came down around his ears. And so what we are watching right now is a political bias against Elon Musk turn into a legal bias against Elon Musk. The legal system, when we talk about the legal system being perverted, I mean, this is an actual perversion of the legal system. So according to Fox Business, a Delaware judge ruled in favor of Tesla investors who sued to challenge a $56 billion pay package for Elon Musk. The decision dares to boldly go where no man has gone before, or at least where no Delaware court has tread, the opinion states. The collection of features characterizing Musk's relationship with Tesla and its directors gave him enormous influence over Tesla. In her ruling, the judge said, quote, the plaintiff is entitled to rescission, meaning that the shareholders of Tesla sued to basically claw back a $56 billion pay package to Musk. I'll get into the pay package in a second because obviously that's the biggest pay package anybody's ever heard of. Why did that happen? I'll get into that in a second. She directed the two parties to confer on a final form of order to implement her decision and submit a joint letter identifying all issues, including fees that need to be addressed to bring the matter to conclusion at the trial level. She added that Tesla was, quote, unable to prove that the stockholder vote was fully informed because the proxy statement inaccurately described key directors as independent and misleadingly omitted details about the process. Now, the problem is that the pay package that Musk negotiated with Tesla was widely derided at the time as basically empty verbiage that would never materialize because effectively speaking, Musk deferred all compensation to a future pay package tied to the increase in the stock valuation of Tesla plus earnings. That's what happened. And everybody knew about it because it was the most widely remarked upon CEO. This is it's the most widely remarked upon CEO pay package literally in human history. So Tesla's agreement with Musk is the largest compensation ever provided to an executive. It's a major factor in making him one of the world's wealthiest individuals. So what happened is that he wasn't guaranteed any salary. This is commented upon by Andrew Ross Sorkin back in 2018. And here's what he wrote, just to make clear what the judge is doing. The judge just hates Musk and so has decided to screw him. But here's what actually happened here. Quote, Tesla's Elon Musk may have the boldest pay plan in corporate history. For the last several years, there's been speculation about Elon Musk's future at Tesla and whether he would step down as chief executive in the next year or two. Mr. Musk stoked that speculation as far back as five years ago when he said he wanted to stay through the introduction of the Model 3. And then in 2014, he said, I'll have to see, you know, how things are going at that point. With the success of Musk's various other endeavors like SpaceX, it was only natural that investors would expect that the Model for Robert Downey Jr.'s Tony Stark might move on to a different role at Tesla. Well, it's four years later, and Musk has now decided to stay. So for, for a decade, by the way, it was a decade-long contract. This is 2018. So what exactly was the compensation plan? Again, this is Andrew Ross Sorkin. Quote, Mr. Musk will be paid only if he reaches a series of jaw-dropping milestones based on the company's market value and operations. Otherwise, he will be paid nothing. So in other words, the compensation package that Musk is receiving was solely incentive-based. It's not as though he signed a contract with Tesla with all of his friends where they just gave him $56 billion. At the time that all this happened, the valuation of Tesla total was $60 billion, 20 bucks a share. That was the valuation of Tesla when they signed this deal. It was approved by 80% of Tesla's shareholders. The plan required him to grow market cap by $50 billion increments with the first milestone starting at $100 billion valuation. The final milestone was $650 billion. So Elon Musk, at a time when the company was valued in the public markets at $60 billion, signed a contract saying, I only get my pay package if I hit 10 if I, if I hit 11x, basically, if I take the current value of Tesla and multiply it by 11, then I get this pay package. Now, if you're a shareholder, like that's a great deal because if we hit that, I'm happy to pay him. And if we don't hit that, then we don't pay him. Great deal, right? Would you make that deal with your boss today or with your company? Would you make the deal? You don't take any pay today. You, you defer all your wages, no, no payment of anything. But if your company increases by 11 times in value, then you get a big bonus. 11, not twice, not three times, 11 times in value. Would you take that deal? Very few people would. Musk is a risk-seeking guy. And Tesla shareholders, they're like, again, what is the problem here? This, this, this is a great deal. Tesla set a dozen targets, each $50 billion more than next, starting at $100 billion, then $150, then $200, all the way on to $650 billion. Also, the company set a dozen revenue and adjusted profit goals. 
Musk would receive 1.68 million shares or about 1% of the company only after he reaches milestones for both. But as Andrew Ross Sorkin wrote at the time, this is 2018, to put these numbers in perspective, Tesla is only worth about $59 billion today. If Musk were somehow able to increase the value of Tesla to $650 billion, a figure many experts would contend is laughably impossible and would make Tesla one of the five largest companies in the U.S. based on current valuations, his stock award could be worth as much as $55 billion. Musk's critics actually at the time complained that it was a publicity stunt, that there was no way he'd reach any of these numbers. And so the whole point of the exercise was to suggest that Tesla was bigger than it was. It's impossible for him to manipulate the system, said Andrew Ross Sorkin, by trying to prop up the stock price for a temporary period, because even once his shares vest, he has to hold them for five years before he can sell them. So he can't actually like get the shares that are worth $56 billion and then immediately turn around and sell them and undercut the value of the company. He can't do that. So the judge struck down what is, again, one of the most risk-laden pay packages in American history because Musk hit his marks. That's insane. It's actually quite evil. If you take a risk and you benefit from that risk by benefiting all the shareholders to the extent that everybody who bought in at 20, this is a person who owned, not, the person who started this owned nine shares of Tesla, nine. Those shares of Tesla, at the time that Musk signed this pay package, those shares of Tesla were priced at $20. Tesla shares today are trading at $188. You don't get to whine about that. I'm sorry, you do not. That's an absurd contention. And just demonstrates, once again, there are members of the judiciary who do not give any craps about property rights or the rule of law. Okay, in just one second, we'll get to social media hearings on the Hill, which, again, it's fascinating to see the sort of coalition that's built against big tech. From the right, the critique makes sense. From the left, the critique is really bad. If you're not a member, become a member. Use code Shapiro. Check out for two months free on all annual plans. Click that link in the description and join us.